So this first talk is on, uh, on evangelism and, um, and public ministry. Uh, and uh, so all things being equal, uh, ministers are called to lead the people of God in evangelism. Uh, we can leave room for quiet, casual hospitality evangelism, um, but the biblical pattern in the Bible and what I want to point out to us this morning um, in the book of Acts in particular uh, demonstrates that the vanguard of evangelism is often uh, is, is public and often quite raucous. Um, arguably, um, it is the work of bold preachers and evangelists in the public square that makes even more room for the rest of the body of Christ to serve and love the lost. And one of the things I've um, found the more um, that I've um, done, maybe sort of the more, um, maybe what we call frontier evangelism, <laughs> um, the, you know, being out on the, the leading edge of um, where um, the hardest cases are, uh, where you're uh, more of a target, um, you're actually, by doing that, you're actually creating room for your people to do more. Even if they're not, um, even if they're not open air preaching or um, doing jail evangelism or, you know, even if they're not there, um, leaders by pushing the limits are creating space for their people. And so, and, um, and then practically speaking, you're also, if you're at the, if you're at the limits, if you're at the edges, you're bringing people in who then need sort of second and third tier evangelism. So you might be the one that meets them on campus. You might meet them in, um, you know, downtown, you might meet them in jail, but then they'll come to church or they'll come to parish study or they'll come to small group Bible study or whatever. And then it's your people that are given opportunities to share the gospel with them, maybe in their home or a follow up dinner or lunch or so on. And so there's a, there's a, a, a ripple effect that we shouldn't, we shouldn't miss. Um, I, in the back of my mind, have been, have been thinking about um, the book of Acts. Um, occasionally when I've thought about my own experience uh, with uh, um, with evangelism and uh, and um, and I totally forgot about this book called Tongues of Flame. I don't know if many of you guys have, have heard of it, but it's by Roger Wagner. It's a study um, on the um, homiletic method of the apostles in the book of Acts. Um, uh, and And just as I was putting together this talk, I thought, you know, he, this guy, I remember Wagner talking about Acts. I wonder if he talks about, and I, and um, it's really, really good. I, I, I read it a number of years ago and uh, went back and, and um, with, skimmed through a few parts of it in preparation for, for this talk. And uh, now I want to go back and read the whole thing again. But um, so I pulled a few, couple of quotes here from him, figured these are things that I thought, and hey, he, here's somebody else who agrees with me. So, um, so Roger Wagner in his excellent work, Tongues of Flame, says the hallmark of the apostolic method of preaching was boldness. This is what the Jewish leaders immediately noticed. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Acts 4.13. Um, they marvel because these men are bold. They're bold. This word for boldness is paresia and means to be open, plain, confident, or bold. Uh, we see this word used a number of times in the New Testament. In Mark um, 8.32, Jesus spoke openly about his coming passion and death. Uh, that's the same word. He's speaking boldly, plainly, clearly. And this draws Peter's rebuke. Um, John uses the same word frequently in his gospel to describe both the boldness of Jesus, him speaking plainly, speaking clearly a number of times, as well as the lack of boldness of others. So in John 7, the people um, are afraid to speak openly about Jesus because of what might happen to them. Uh, they're, they're afraid to speak boldly about Jesus. This is how Peter describes his own sermon on, on Pentecost in Acts 2.29, um, this is the part where he's quoting uh, from, from Psalm 16 and, and saying, you know, brothers, let me speak plainly to you. David is dead, right? That's the same word. Um, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking bold. Let me, let me be bold here for a minute, guys. David's bones are here in our city. So clearly Psalm 16 is not talking about him. 
um, his body saw corruption. He's talking, this, this psalm is talking about Jesus. Um, immediately after the Jews released Peter and John, after their, uh, their skirmish over the lame man in Acts um, 4, um, the, the apostles specifically pray for more boldness, same word, and then it says, uh, immediately following that, and God filled them with the Holy Spirit and gave them boldness. So um, they're, 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 they heal the, the lame man, they have this run-in with them, they're bold with them, because the, of course the, the leaders are saying, you guys can't preach Jesus here, and they say, well, is it better for us to listen to God or you? Um, I think we're going to go with God, and, um, and so we're going to keep preaching. You know, and the Jewish leaders are, again, that's, they're astonished at their boldness. And that's when they're like, what? what's going on here? And they knew that they had been with Jesus. They leave and immediately go back to their friend's house and, and pray for more boldness, immediately following that. And then it says the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were filled with boldness. Same word all the way through um, the, the story. This is how Barnabas describes Paul's preaching immediately after his conversion. Uh, so Barnabas puts in a good word for Paul to the, to the uh, folks uh, in Jerusalem, saying, yeah, I've seen him. He's been preaching boldly since he was converted, because, of course, they knew that this Paul guy was the guy that had overseen the execution of Stephen and was persecuting the church, and they're like, you know, whoa. And Barnabas says, no, I've, I've seen him preaching boldly. Jesus, um, you can accept him. Is, this is the real deal. This is how Luke describes him running into trouble with the Hellenists in Acts 9.29. Um, it's this same boldness that got Paul and Barnabas kicked out of Antioch and Pisidia, Acts 13. This boldness stirred up a mob in Iconium, 14.3. Likewise created dissension in the synagogue in Ephesus, 19.9. And the book of Acts closes with Paul in Rome under house arrest, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching Jesus with all boldness unhindered, 28.29. Last verse of the book, right? That's just me doing a catalog of that word. Um, you, could, you could broaden it by just uh, looking for more of the you know, what are the characteristics of this word, even though it's not used explicitly, when are they speaking plainly uh, the gospel? Where, where are they going and preaching and teaching clearly and plainly? Um, and and you, I think, probably could add to this. But I think, um, clearly, this is one of the ways that Luke has uh, organized the book of Acts. Um, he's, he's organized the work of the, the apostles, the preaching of the gospel, the work of the Spirit, um, in Acts as a story of boldness. And I think that boldness, of course, begins and is grounded in Jesus. So go, you know, go back to, they knew they were bold, they were amazed by it, and they knew they had been with Jesus. Right? Jesus is the original bold one. He's the one saying, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. And that runs him smack, it collides him with Peter, who says, no! And Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan, you don't know what you're talking about. Right? Um, so Jesus is openly declaring the gospel that he's going to, he's going to accomplish. And then once the Holy Spirit is given, that same spirit is given to the apostles to openly declare that gospel, that boldness. Um, so I want to be clear um, that the man of God is not to be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, correcting his opponents with gentleness. That's 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. But let us be just as clear that a man of God with no opponents is no shepherd of the flock. Um, I, I find it striking that when Paul um, uh, is giving these instructions to Timothy, he says, the man of God is not to be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And we tend to camp out on the gentleness part, which is important. But I think it's also important to point out that you're supposed to be correcting your opponents with gentleness, which means you have opponents and you're correcting them, right? A lot of times we think of gentleness as being the thing that would make you walk away from your opponents. Well, I want to be gentle and I don't want to say anything to stir them up. And of course, there's time not to say anything. There's a time to be silent before your accusers. Jesus was silent before his accusers. But, but Paul says, generally speaking, you know, don't be, don't be a quarrelsome person. Be kind to everyone and be graciously correcting your opponents. So keep correcting them. Keep correcting them. If you keep reading in 2 Timothy 2, 26, um, it says, it may be that God will release some of them from their errors that they've been held captive by Satan. Right? 
Um, it, Paul says, you know, the reason why you keep correcting your opponents is because if they're if they're bound by lies and deception, that's that's the devil, and you need to, your job is to free them. That's your job, Timothy. Do it gently, but do it. This means that the question is not whether you will have controversy. The question is which controversies will you choose? Or, as the case may be, which controversies will choose you? Um, uh, frequently, we, we don't get to pick. Um, it, it, just, it just comes. Um, but, but the thing that I want to I camp out on in this, in, this, um, in this talk is this connection, though, between boldness that creates and jumps into argumentation, controversy, dissension, uh, rejection, all these things, and how God uses it to build the church. That, 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 that's, that's the connection. Um, boldness is absolutely required because we don't naturally want to. Um, we, we don't, and, and this, this ties into what I was talking about last night, I think uh, frequently the reason why we don't, um, I was, I remember who, one of you guys, I was talking with one of you guys, it was Steve, um, last night, um, but I don't think being a, um, being militant um, with the word means getting louder, <laughs> right? Um, being bold with word doesn't mean um, getting red in the face. Um, being, you know, fighting the good fight um, doesn't mean shouting more in the pulpit. That, that's not what I'm saying. Um, maybe occasionally it means you need to raise your voice. Um, I think, I think what, um, Acts shows us is more than anything, being bold for the gospel means actually speaking more clearly. It means speaking more plainly. It means, it means taking the Bible and, um, and the word of God, the gospel and I think when you understand it well, and when it's when you're you're marinating in it, and you and you understand particularly, I think some of the stuff I was talking about last night with the the typology, um, the story, what's going on, it, it's not like you've got to like heft this sledgehammer and be like, okay, I'm going to swing harder this time. But it's almost like you take it and you you've got there's so much packed into it that you take it and you just sort of go like, ding, and then and then they go ah. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, that hurts. You, know, you, you just kind of gently took out the, the little demon that's clutching their heart and you just took a little dagger and you just slit its throat right in front of them very gently. And they, and they freak out because you just, you just, you just got, you just went after their precious, right? So, so the man of God is gentle but he's gentle and he's going out, he, he's, he's, he's more precise. He's more, he's more direct and he's finding the, you see this, there's this little thing right here. This is the thing that's hurting you. And they're screaming, right? There's a, there's a mess and we don't want that mess. And so, you know, so I, uh, I think, I think frequently, I mean, longer, you know, you do this ministry, you find that there, I think if you're honest with yourself, there are all kinds of places where you don't want to say what needs to be said because you don't want to deal with the mess. You know that if you step in and say something, there's going to be a mess. And then they might tell their friends and there's going to be a bigger mess and then someone's going to blog it or put it on Facebook and then, you know, and then they and then you're going to have a mess. Well, Jesus grows his church through messes. And we, and and you have to be wise, and I'm not saying that, you know, you just um, again, it's, it, this is not a um, this is not a just you know any mess will do, <laughs> you know make a mess. That's not what I'm saying. But if the gospel needs to come to bear, if the truth needs to be told, um, you're the pastor. You're the one that's called to guard the people. You're the one that's called to lead the people fighting sin. Mess or no mess. But one of the one of the one of the w really cool things about the Book of Acts is that it shows us that. Paul walks into towns, preaches the gospel, makes messes, and the kingdom grows. That's, that's the story of Acts. Walk into town, make people mad, start the church. Right? That's, that's, how, that's how the gospel goes forth. What the book of Acts demonstrates is that this is one of the principal means the Holy Spirit is determined for the gospel to go forth and the church to be built up.
just a little note here. I'm not claiming anything uh, particularly significant about the number of mobs I found in the book of Acts. I found 14. Um, one friend told me he'd heard there were 14, so I went with that. I found 14 too. Maybe if you count, I'm not, there's not a, a magic way that I added it all up, but it's, it's tidy. <laughs> so I went with it. Um, you might find ways to count it differently, but here I made a list for you. So we have the Pentecost commotion. Um, one of the first times I went out, uh, um, open air preaching, I, uh, um, let me back up. I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, somebody, somebody asked me about this last night. Um, I grew up in the OPC, um, and, um, and my dad is a, um, a, is a OPC pastor. He, um, he has always done um, lots of evangelism. So I grew up with going out with my dad door to door. Um, we were always out in the park meeting people. We had literature tables, um, you know, set stuff up at the state fair, went to the mall, handed out books. I've been with, you know, since I, as long as I can remember, I can remember going with my dad and listening to my dad present the gospel to people. My dad has never open air preached and I've never been around open air preaching in my life. Um, and, uh, and so it wasn't something that um, I was particularly interested in doing. Um, and uh, one, uh, one week, um, so every, every month, the Christ Church and Trinity elders get together for uh, a joint elder meeting. And Doug and I rotate off and on who uh, gives a brief kind of devotional at the beginning of the elder meeting. And um, it was my turn, and I was... Um, I was just um, doing my normal Bible reading for that week, and, um, and it must have been the day before, Tuesday or Wednesday, um, I, I came across one of the passages where, uh, where Paul talks about um, urges, I think it might have been the end of Corinthians, or maybe it was in Timothy, um, where, where he's urging um, them to, to stir up um, their faith, be stirred up, stir one another up to good works, and, and, I, and as I was reading, I was just, my own personal reading, and I was just really convicted by it thinking you know we uh, we we need we need to be stirred up we need we, we can't we can't just be hanging out here we can't be apathetic we need to be um and, and we're the leaders we're the pastors we're the elders we've got to be the ones if we want our people to be stirred up we got to be stirred up so i you know i was, just kind of got turned up about it and i was like all right this is what i'm doing i'm going to do this as my devotional tomorrow went in there um gave this you know exhortation to the to the elders um and I get back to my office immediately after the elder meeting. I open my email inbox, and at the top is this email from a guy in our in our church, really good guy. One line, <laughs> it just says, "Toby, there are many people that don't know Jesus on the university campus. Will you please go with me on Friday and preach to them, Jason?" <laughs> and I was like, "God." <laughs> What? <laughs> you know, like, um, I could not, I, mean, I, 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 I don't want to do that. I don't know how to do that and not, that not be awkward. I don't know how to do that and that not be embarrassing and stupid. But I had just given this exhortation to the elders that we must go out of our comfort zones. We must not be bound by what we think is normal. We must, and I, and I knew, I was like, this is, you know, this is God, you know? And if I say no, I have, I have absolutely no business standing up on Sunday morning and saying anything to them. So before I could change my mind, I said, yes, what time? Yeah, replied. And then I got on Google to try to, to, to search <laughs> open air preaching. <laughs> and, How to. And, it, and immediately found like a half a dozen examples of what I did not want to do. <laughs> Right, um, I found some helpful stuff too, but um, but I had never I had never done it before in my life. I had never seen it done before in my life, other than a couple of you know YouTube videos that freaked me out. Um, and and so, but I went out and um, and and this is leading to this first one, the Pentecost commotion. Um, you know, I one of the best one of the best things about open air preaching is it will make you pray like you have never prayed before. Right? How, 
how is this a good idea? <laughs> like, just as you're walking up there, like, this is not a good idea, not a good idea, not a good idea. This is stupid, this is stupid, this is stupid, this is stupid. Oh my God, what am I doing here? Right? I mean, this is, there's, nothing, there's nothing about it that's sexy or cool. Nothing. Right? It's never, it's never not awkward. Right? I mean, who's going to introduce you? Right? There's nothing about it that's cool. And you, and you just pray. The, one of the most comforting things that happened, I think it was that time, might have been the, one of the first or second times it happened. I, I got up and started preaching. And the guy rides by on the bike and just yells, You're drunk! And I, and, and, and I just, and it hit me. Like, and it was one of the most comforting things that happened to me. That's what they said. That's exactly what they said. When the apostles started preaching, they said, you're drunk. I said, no, I'm not drunk. It's Jesus, right? He's alive. Um, and, um, you know, w- when you start getting called the same names that the apostles got called, I feel like we're probably, we're probably doing it right. Right? And if we're, and if we're not, if, we're, if you never get accused of being drunk, or you only get accused of being drunk after you've had a few drinks... Right? I mean, like, right, right, I mean, how sad. Um, so, 14 mobs. There's a Pentecost commotion. They're called drunks. There's a big crowd. Result, 3,000 baptisms. The lame man controversy. They heal a lame man. There's a big crowd. Um, a lots of controversy. They're hauled before the leaders. Result, 2,000 more believers. There's a commotion after the prison, um, uh, after prison break. This is chapter 5. This is all going through Acts. Result, disciples increase in number. Controversy with Stephen, chapter 6 and 7. You know that story. Result, the disciples are scattered, preaching the word wherever they go. Saul confesses Jesus in Damascus. Plots ensue. This is the only place I couldn't find, chapter 9, any explicit result listed. Based on everything else, I'm still guessing it was good. Um, he, he, that's when he's let down out of the, uh, the side of the, the wall in the, in the basket. Um, number six, Saul preaches in Jerusalem. Plots ensue. Result, the church had peace and was built up. Angry crowd in Antioch and Pisidia. Chapter 13, result, Gentiles rejoicing and glorifying God and believing. Rowdy crowds in Iconium. Chapter 14, result, half the city sides with the apostles. Number eight, violent mob in Lystra. Stones Paul, 14, chapter 14, result, disciples are strengthened and encouraged. Violent mob in Philippi, result, Philippian jailer and family converted, the brothers encouraged. Violent mob in Thessalonica, result, many devout Greeks and leading women believe. Angry crowd in Berea, result, many Jews believed along with a number of leading Greek women. Riot in Ephesus, result, the name of Jesus was extolled, the word increased, and the brothers were encouraged. Angry mob in Jerusalem, result, the gospel is preached to the crowd. Violent dissension in the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Result, a chance to preach to the governors and go to Rome. Um, I think there's a pattern there. Right? Um, they go into the city. They, 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 go to, they go to the place. They preach Jesus. Um, some begin to believe. Some ask questions. It gets heated. People get angry, mad. And that's how the church starts. Um, I'd never noticed this number 14, uh, even within the Sanhedrin, right? This is, you know, the, the Pharisees and they're the priests and, 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 and Sadducees. And, uh, and, and of course, Paul no, recognizes that there's this, you know, division. And so he drops the resurrection bomb on them, right? And knows that it'll probably stir them up. And they have this argumentation. And then Luke says, and then it got violent. <laughs> In the Sanhedrin, saying it got violent, you know, I don't know, fists were flying. I, you know, I don't know, like, what are these guys doing? Um, we should note that in most of these instances, the results I've noted follow from the mobs. So most of these instances, it's actually Luke is literally telling us there's a mob, there's anger, and then it actually gives us the result. And they believed, and they were encouraged, and the brothers were strengthened. Right? Most of the, most of the instances, that's what's going on. 
Um, a couple of the cases, the mobs are a result of the preaching of the gospel and conversion. So in a couple of instances, it'll say Paul was preaching there for many months or many years, and many believed, half the city believed or whatever, and then the Jews came in and stir up dissension, right? But, but either way, the point holds true. Preaching boldly means public controversy, and public controversy received by faith is good for the gospel, Public controversy received by faith is good for the gospel. Um, when somebody is upset, when somebody misunderstands, when somebody says you're wrong, it's an opportunity. Um, number one, well, check yourself. But number two, oh, Jesus must, must want, want me to preach the gospel. That's what's going on. Um, and so when I, um, some of the best times I've had um, on campus preaching have been um, when people are mad at me. Best times. Um, because what happens is, is somebody, you know, um, this last fall, one of the first times that I went out, um, I, I, I always, I just, I just stand up and say, hi, my name's Toby Sumter. My name is, uh, I'm from Trinity Reformed Church here in town. I'm one of the pastors there. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about Jesus today. And then I just launch in. And, um, and, I, and I got like, you know, th- half of that. And this guy just, just tears into me. Is, you know, just starts cussing me out. You're, you know, you, you're, 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 uh, you're here to condemn us. You tell us you're all going to hell. You're a jerk. You know, um, get out of here. We hate you. We don't want you here. And, and I, and, and boom, a huge crowd, right? Everybody just stops what they're doing. <laughs> Ready-made audience. What do you think, pastor? Right. And then I get to, and then I get to preach Jesus to this huge crowd on campus, and they all want to know what I think. Right? Best case scenario, somebody's mad at me. Right? And obviously, I care about them. I don't think I, you know, when somebody's worked up like that, I probably don't have a lot of chance with them at the moment. But I have a ready-made crowd that wants to know what the Jesus man thinks about that angry guy. And what I think is that Jesus died on the cross for his sins and all of your sins, right? And then he rose again from the dead and was seen by witnesses and poured out his spirit. And now this world belongs to him, right? And God created you and he made you and he gave you this world and he, and, and he blessed you with life and health and goodness. And you've sinned and turned from that and you know it. And you have this guilt problem, you have this shame problem. And that's why Jesus died. And there I am ready-made crowd, man's yelling at me, and they want to know the gospel, right? And so best case scenario, there's, a, there's somebody mad at me. Um, this has been my experience. Um, I, I sometimes go up and I preach, and, I, and, and it's not, nobody, nobody bites, you know, nobody's, nobody's interested. And, um, you know, I've, there's been other traveling preachers that come through our campus who are very antagonistic, um, you know, kind of the your Turner burn um, style. That's that's not that's not my style. Um, I, I I I do talk about hell. I do talk about sin. I do talk about homosexuality. I do talk. I mean, I talk about all of those things. Um, but I um, but I, I also want it to be clear that I'm there because I love them and I care about them um, and I want to know them. And so I, I try to hold that together. Um, and um, so. I would say about half the time I preach for about 15 or 20 minutes and people will, will kind of stay kind of away and I'll see them on the edges. Um, I always, I always have a ready-made audience from the smokers, right? They got to come out and smoke. Um, but, uh, but there's usually people kind of on the fringes that'll hang out. And if nobody comes up and asks a question, if somebody comes and asks a question or gets angry at me, the crowd just boom is there. It's like, it's like magic. You know, there will be 50 or 100 people like that. Um, yeah, no, so, so, yeah, so, so what we, what I have done um, is, um, I, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to be a, um, I, I don't want to, a, uh, I don't want to be underhanded, but what we have done is a couple of times, um, Doug's come out with me, um, and um, we introduce, we both introduce ourselves, and then we, and then we actually explicitly say, um, in in a minute or so, um, one of us is going to actually ask the other guy questions that maybe you're thinking. 
And so I've gotten up and I'll start, pre- you know, so we say, I'm, I'm Toby from Trinity Reformed Church here in Moscow. This is Pastor Doug Wilson. He's from Christ Church in, here in town as well. I'm going to be preaching the gospel today. And in a couple minutes, Doug's going to ask me a question about the gospel that you might be wondering, you might be thinking. And so I'll start preaching and then he'll say, so are you saying, you know, that we can trust this, this you know, collection of documents that was written over thousands of years by a bunch of people and, and that, you know, we should base our life on it? You know, whatever you're saying that if, you know, uh, two men are in a committed relationship, that that's not love, right? So he'll, you know, we'll, and, or in the vice versa, sometimes he started out and then I'll ask him questions. Um, and yes, that's actually helped too. We've, I've, we've had this, that other people all of a sudden be like, yeah, and what about, and they feel like, you know, then it's like, it's cool to ask questions. Um, and we've had, we've had great crowds gather for that as well. Nah, we don't do altar calls, but yes, we, uh, we've done some of that to help. Um, and that it's, it's gone well. Um, given this resume though, it's not inconceivable. So I'm talking about this, these 14 things back in acts again. It's not inconceivable that how Paul would be accused of stirring up quote, dissension among all the Jews throughout the world. Acts 24, five, right? Wherever Paul goes, dissension breaks out, right? That's his reputation. Wherever he goes, he makes enemies because he's faithful, right? Um, and I, and I, I think that modern people, and I'm including myself in this, we have a natural, um, we, 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 we have this natural aversion um, to it. This natural aversion to making enemies, this natural aversion to having opponents, this natural aversion to this, the, to controversy. And, um, and I, and I think to the extent that the book of Acts demonstrates for us that this is how the gospel goes forth to that extent. Um, we are, we are playing church. We are pretending. Uh, we're, we're, we're not, we're not actually going out and finding the places where the gospel needs to come and collide with our culture. Um, one of the things that's been really, really striking, I didn't anticipate this, is um, how many, and, and those of you probably maybe in other places like in the South and so on will we'll run into this even more, but um, I am up there preaching as much for Christians as I am for non-Christians. I can't tell you how many times I've had Christians come up to me and say, Thank you so much for being here. We're all alone. Nope, nobody, you know, our professors hate us. Nobody understands us. Thank you for being here. Um, and Christ, kids that grew up in the church who have left the church. Talked to so many kids who grew up in the church. You know, you know, you grew up in the church. Yeah, I went to church. I went to you know Presbyterian church. Went to Baptist church. Went to Reformed church. Met them all. Well, you know, going to church. Well, I came to college, and then I just kind of realized that you know religion and science don't match anymore, and so I'm you know I, I just kind of went with science. You know, I I it just it just doesn't um, it's not important to me anymore. And I think about their parents, right? Their parents who are back home praying for them, right? Who know their kids are straying for the, from the faith. Their pastors, their Sunday school teachers, their youth pastors who labored for them. And now they know these kids are straying from, from the faith. I'm up there for them, right? That God would draw them back into his fold. And... Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm meeting them, and some of them are coming back to faith. Um, the, um, but, it's, but it's happening in the context of, um, you know, I'm, I'm that guy. <laughs> like I'm that, that big red-bearded guy that, that, that yells about Jesus, you know. Um, my wife went into a coffee shop downtown last year and uh, I think it was a Saturday afternoon I gave her 
a few hours, just, you know, go, go relax. And uh, she went downtown to this coffee shop and um, gets, get, gets some tea or something from, uh, and the, the girl, the baristas, you know, there, and, and it's the coffee shop. It's a coffee shop that I go into periodically, but she, she says, she, she's chatting there and she says, yeah, my, um, my husband comes down here and studies sometime. And um, I, I don't remember how she made the connection, but all of a sudden the barista said, is he that guy that preaches on campus? <laughs> my wife was like, no, I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but, but it was like, but it was like, yeah, that's my, that's my husband. And, and like this barista girl, you know, was like, yeah, that's that. I'm that guy. And, um, and now, and now, and through that going, you know, I, I try to, I try to go up there every week. Um, I, I've got all kinds of regulars. People come and listen. They know, hey, to- hey, Pastor Toby, how you doing? You know, atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, whatever. You know, hey, Pastor Toby, how's it going? You know, and I've had, you know, sometimes they were the ones that I was like yelling with, and some of them come back. That original guy that I told you about that was mad, just cussed me out. He kept on coming all fall, kept on coming. And he, you know, first, you know, he'd be, you know, I'd be sentenced five minutes into it, and he'd just show up and just start hollering. And I'd just go, and we'd, we'd, we'd argue, and we'd talk, and everything. And then right around Thanksgiving, um, it was one of the times I went up with, with Doug, and we did kind of the, you know, um, back and forth. And, and I think we had, we had a beautiful fall. Um, you know, weather helps a ton <laughs> when it's beautiful and people want to be outside. We had a beautiful fall in Idaho, and, and it was sunny and you know, warm up, up into late October and November. And... Um, and, and we were doing this question and answer thing and, and we had this, probably one of the biggest crowds we had, probably, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred people, just this, this, this huge crowd in the rotunda and just people hollering questions at us back and forth. And this, this young, this one other kid shows up and just was being a you know, complete ass to Doug, just, you know, calling him names. And, um, and, and Doug just was so gracious and everybody saw it. And that, that original guy that had been so angry, all of a sudden, in the middle of that, that particular crowd, his tone started changing as he watched Doug interact with this little punk kid that was just being a jerk, complete jerk. That, and, and in the middle of that hollering, he was involved and there other people and just, you know, just kind of this ping pong you know, game. This, um, and, and, I, and then I, I'm, I, I, I called out that, the original guy. I said, hey, what's your name? And he said, I'm not telling you my name. You know, I've never told you my name yet. I'm not going to tell you my name now. I was like, all right, fine. Guy in the orange shirt. You know, he's wearing an orange shirt. And I, and, I, and I replied to him. And then, you know, we went on for a half hour, 45 minutes, whatever. And the crowd kind of dissipates. And we finish up. And, and that guy who had been the original guy that, you know, was pitching a fit at me and he kept on coming back, comes up to me and said, hey, my name's Justin. I just wanted you to know um, my name. And, and I said, yeah, I'm Toby. Good to meet you. And, um, and during, that com- you know, during that mob, his tone changed. And he, he said, I, even though I'm really antagonistic to you guys because I, I used to be a Christian and I don't believe that stuff anymore, I've really come to respect you guys. I appreciate that you guys actually care about us and you care about the truth. And I said, thanks. I really appreciate that. And uh, I said, well, tell me your background. Tell me your story. And, you know, he, he grew up Mormon, converted to some kind of charismatic Pentecostalism. Then it got really weird. And then it was the occult. Then it was hard drugs. Then it was rehab. Then it was... Met a, met a white a woman who was Roman Catholic, converted to Roman Catholicism, and then went just atheist. You know, crazy, you know. Now he's a philosophy major at U of I. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. But we've gotten together for lunch now three times. <clears throat> and I keep running into him in Safeway and other places, and I'm pretty sure that's not an accident. You know. He, he, he sent me a text at Christmas and just said, hey, I just want to say Merry Christmas. This is the guy 
you know, I wasn't a sentence out of my introduction tore into me. Right? You know, that's why I, I'm praying for angry people. I'm praying for, I'm praying for a mob. I'm praying for a riot. You know, because, because I'm seeing exactly what Paul experienced happening. Um, whether it's the whether it's the people that I'm actually you know hitting head on, or it's the people that are listening. You know, I've had so many conversations. I'll preach for a few minutes, and you know, nothing, not much will happen. And I'll you know, say, hey, I'm, I'm again. I'll, I usually close by saying, again, my name is Toby Sumter. I'm one of the pastors at Trinity Reformed Church. Thank you for listening to me. If you have any questions, I'll be hanging around for a little while, and then, I, then I'm done. <laughs> First few times I did that, I got like applause. It's kind of hilarious. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right, <laughs> but but then I, um, you know, then I just kind of look around for people that are hanging out, have been listening, and I'll go up and talk to them. And and I and I'm surprised at people that I meet for the first time. I was like, yeah, hey, I'm Toby, and they'll introduce themselves and find out you know who they are and where they're from, and and how many of them say, oh yeah, I come out and listen to you. I don't, I don't remember them. I don't see them before. I, I've heard you before. I know who you are. You know, like they, they've been there. They've been in the crowds. They've been listening longer than I realize. Toby, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Can I ask another one? Uh, Do it. <laughs> Do you have to, do you find yourself having to translate from your reform speak, your church speak? Uh, do you find yourself throwing things out and go, oh, no one's going to, or most everyone's not going to know what I just said and I have to now explain it? Or are you, are you becoming bilingual as you do this? Yeah, yeah that's a really good question. I, I was, what, the, the, the thing that I've found is, I think I, I, I fairly, just I guess naturally, I think I do make, I make that jump, I think, pretty easily just because I'm, a, I'm, um, I'm naturally pretty attuned to like people, and as soon as I see like a you know eyes glaze over or or you know like I'm not I mean you don't I mean you you don't have any like you're you're, you're um, you have no time like every line is is meaningful. People are walking by, and everything has to has to land. You know you want it to land, you want it to be meaningful, and so um, I think I think I'm doing that sort of subconsciously. Um, I think if anything, it's interesting. I was thinking about this. I was chatting with CJ about this yesterday in the car, but like open air preaching has changed the way I preach in church. And, and I think all for the better. Um, but, um, but, I, but yes, absolutely. You can't talk to a 19-year-old kid who's you know, been smoking pot last weekend about, you know, it, it, I mean, everything hones in on why the hell should this kid care? Why should I give you the time of day? You know, and, and the gospel has to matter. Or the gospel matters. I'm like I'm out here because the gospel matters to you, kid. You have you have you have a guilt problem. You have a, you have a sin issue. You have brokenness in your life, and it hurts. And 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 I I know the one who can can make it better. And I have to convince that person that that's that's true. That that this. Um, and obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to a crowd of people with vast different experiences. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people that want to have the more philosophical conversation. Well, how do you know that you, you know, um, you know how, how do you have epistemic certainty? How do you know that um, the Bible is true? How do you know this? Um, you know, lots of conversations about the reliability of science, evolution versus creation, all that kind of stuff. One of the things you find really quickly is that um, secularism is a... Um, has been, I mean, we are, we are seeing it all around us, but secularism has been um, an amazingly um, successful, um, 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 uh, as an amazingly um, uh, catechized the kids, right? One of the striking things is none of them are original. <laughs> they all are just parroting all the same crap you've been hearing. Right? Well, why can't I do that? I'm, I, it makes me happy. I mean, like just, just you know, secular humanism, materialism, relativism. It's like they all went to the same schools. Oh, they did. 
It's like they all got the same catechism and not one of them has anything original. You talk to one of them and it's like, come on, can't you come up with something better? And they don't. It's the same. It's the same. I mean, I've talked to hundreds of kids and it's the same. And so, and, but it's, it's, I've realized I mean, your, your, your options are get mad and annoyed and, and walk away or get better. You know what they're going to say. Which means more punchy, more... Yeah, and, and so it only makes you better. You know what they're going to say, and so you just, you just anticipate it. You're going to say this. How did you know I was going to say that? Because you and all your friends say it every single time. Right? That's why I know that. Right? Yeah. We have, we have a guy that's a kind of apologetics guy. He's not so nationally somewhat recognized the base, Dan Barker, one of those kind of guys. And he's done a, a bunch of this, and he did a men's study for us. We talked about this. And he said, you know, in his college experience, he said, you know, these are the top objections I'll get. And one of them was dinosaurs. Have you heard that objection? No. Dinosaurs, that disproves God. Huh. And I'm thinking, how low have we all sunk down to that that becomes a, an objection that someone would raise? I just wonder if that uh, ever comes up. I haven't heard that. version of the science thing, but it's yeah. sort of like, well, we know there are dinosaurs, and the Bible doesn't have dinosaurs, so obviously. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard the, uh, I mean, yeah, you, all, you hear the, you know, how, how, could, how could all the animals be in the ark? Um, didn't, didn't God, um, uh, I, almost every single time I'm out there, it's like clockwork. Someone's going to ask me about, you know, didn't God authorize um, genocides in the Old Testament? Um, What's your punchy answer to that? Um, well, I, I, I don't have, I don't know if I have a punchy answer, answer to that, but I always, but I always I, first of all, I say, um, did he? Um, where? I don't know, I just heard that one time. Well, before you make accusations, why don't you have a, why don't you tell me where it is and what it is? Um, God did not authorize genocides, but God did authorize the, um, the slaughter of um, particular cities. Yes. What's wrong with that? Well, how can you say that? That's awful. That's horrible. Why? Right? Who said? You think we're a bunch of protoplasm. Right? That's, you, have, you have no moral objection to that at all. If you have a... By what standard are you going to condemn God? I mean, that's 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 the that's the gist of it. You know, well, it's just I just know it's wrong. How do you know it's wrong? Is racism wrong? Why is it wrong? Right? Well, it's because our society told us it's wrong. Our, our, our people, you know, it's it's against the law. Right? So if you live in the 1840s and 1850s and it's okay to beat a black man, treat him like property, what are you going to say to that? If you live in you know 1930s in Nazi Germany, right? Yeah, right. I will, uh, you know. What are your, what are the standard, you know, maybe just objections you get? I mean, you mentioned genocide. What else? What are the other ones that come along? Are they all kind of the category? Do you kind of come back to the idea of moral, what are your moral imperatives? I mean, yeah, that'll, I mean, that's a, that's a regular one. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time also talking about um, how people account for goodness. So there's a problem of evil. But I always, I also say, do you believe in goodness? Everybody believes in goodness. Oh yeah, I believe in goodness. Where is it? Why? Where do you get that from? Really? Like you actually believe there's actually goodness, real goodness in this world. Good things, beautiful things. Is it really goodness or is it just your taste? And they really want to say there's really goodness in the world, but they don't have any grounds for saying that there's really goodness in the world. Flip side of the same coin. Right, just the other side of it. Um, we, um, one of the things that I found um, more recently helpful has been um, talking about the problem of, of, um, of shame and guilt um, and asking for a better, um, so, so I, I'll, I'll present the case for Christianity as being one in which um, I don't believe Christianity is the only plausible um, accounting for all the data of in, in our existence. I don't believe Christianity is the only plausible 
accounting for it, but I'm persuaded it's, that it's the best accounting of all the data, right? And so I want, I want kids, um, you know, they, they say, you know, they assume that I'm closed-minded and I don't want to read anything about the Bible, and I say, no, I think you should read the Quran. I think you should. I think you should read the Buddha. I think you should read um, um, about Hinduism. I think you should read all about the religions of the world. And then I think you should decide for yourself. And, 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 and so you, you, you should look at the world. Open your eyes. What actually best accounts for the, for the data in the world? Um, frequently, they're like, whoa, oh, oh, well, uh, well, okay, well. You know, and you know, like they, they don't they don't know what to do with that. You know, like I mean, I was, I, like I I read um, atheists, and I say, have you read? You know, these guys. Have have you have you read them? And sometimes they have, but a lot of times they're like, oh well, no. I mean, no. I just you know. Okay, well then, how you know? How do you know? How do you know that that your assumptions? You just listen. You're just parroting what your what your professor told you. Right? Why don't you read it for yourself? Why don't you look at the world yourself? And think for yourself. And of course, I'm taking the rhetoric that they've been told, and I'm just, <laughs> right. you know, you idiot. Right? Think for yourself for once. And and that oftentimes pulls them off. But one of the things I've I've talked I've used more recently is, you know, I've said on a secular accounting of the, of the world, at what point do you believe that um, a secularist has the right to tell somebody who's murdered or raped? or abused, at what point do you have the right to tell them that they're absolved of their sin, of their crime? At what point can you tell a rapist or a murderer or an abuser, okay, what if they feel really bad? Right? What if they feel really bad? Like they really do. Like they feel bad about what they did. At what point can you tell them, okay, you felt bad enough? All right, now, I think that's enough. I mean, her life is ruined, but you know, I think that's enough. Go on with your life now. When has someone suffered enough? Or, make it personal to you, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell them, even nickel-dime sins, little lies, little, little theft, um, losing your temper, the best that a, secular, a secularist can do is try to put things back. Right? When you know that you've done something wrong, the best thing you can do is try to put it back. So you lie and you go back and you try to tell the truth. You say, I was wrong and I t tell the truth. If you stole something, you try to put it back. If you broke something, you try to replace it. That's the best you can do. But at the end of the day, you're still the guy who did it. <laughs> you're still left with the shame of being the guy who told that lie, who stole that thing. Yeah, you put it back, but there you are. You're still that guy. How do you get rid of that? And it, there's no answers. Well, I've had several people say, I've never thought of it like that before. Try to be good. Right, well, that's what I say. I, mean, I, I, I offer that. I said, I think a lot of people try to be good. Try to be better. But I said, but how do you know you've been good enough? When have you been good enough? Notice I'm not even talking about heaven. <laughs> I'm just talking about this world, this life. How do you fix that problem? And when have you been good enough? And, and you don't know. And I, and, I and I tell them, the, the reason why we instinctively know that we can't know is because, um, because there's, there's an infinite value to life. And we instinctively know that when we've sinned and we've, 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 we've harmed somebody else and we've done something that we know is wrong, we know that there's, in some way, you can't get to the bottom of it. We can't. We can maybe approximate, we can kind of try to, but we know it's never quite good enough. And then, and that's why I, and that's why I tell them. I, that's why I found, I find, the gospel so um, compelling because Jesus comes and he understands that we have that problem. Uh, I don't know of any other religion in the world that that comes and addresses us and says you have this problem. Right? A every other religion in the world is trying to get you to ignore it, basically, or try to make up for it in some way, and not actually face it head on and so I, I find I find Jesus more compelling because Jesus tells the truth he tells the truth about what it means to be human 
our, our human existence is, is, um, is, is marked by this guilt and shame. Um, I, I, taught, I chatted with a kid uh, two weeks ago who uh, was listening as I preached, and then afterwards I went up and just introduced myself um, and had no church background at all. Um, I, I walked through the, he just said, I never had any use for religion. I don't, I don't, it's not useful for me. I don't have, you know, it's not my thing. So I walk, kind of walked through this with him and, and I, and I said, so you know, what do you think? And he said, so yeah, I, I've, I've never heard anything like that before. And, um, I, I can see why, I can see why that would be really important. And I, and I said, would you like to get together and talk more? And he says, no, nah, I, don't, I don't think so. I'm all right. And, and, that, and, I, and he said, um, and I said, do you have a Bible? And he said, no. He said, but my, my roommate does. My roommate's a Christian. And I said, oh, I said, well, you should, you should see if you could borrow his Bible and, and, uh, and, and, and read it. He said, I, I said, I think I will. I said, all right, cool. And then just on Friday, on Good Friday, I was out there again and, um, and, and I saw him right away, actually, when I got out there. And so I walked right up to him and said, hey, man, how's it going? And I said, did you, did you happen to borrow your roommate's Bible? And he says, yeah. I said, I did. I said, what did you, you read? He said, well, I read this, the whole first book of Genesis. And I said, wow. Like, the whole thing? He said, yeah. And, uh, and, then, and, and I said, what did you think? He said, and he said, it was, it was really interesting. He said, um, and, and, I, and I particularly asked him, I said, um, what do you think about those, the story of Joseph? And uh, I said, you know, this is Easter weekend. And the story of Joseph is this crazy, cool story of, it's a preview of Jesus. And I walked through that with him. And, uh, and he, said, he, said, he said, yeah, I see that. That's really, that's really interesting. And, uh, and I said, well, you should, you, know, uh, you should go to church with your roommate this weekend. And uh, he said, I think I will. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that's the... That's the kind of, that's the, those are the kind of conversations I have again and again. Um, and, and people, um, lots of people don't care, you know? I mean, lots, lots of people, you know, I mean, I mean don't, don't get me wrong. There's lots of times, you know, you just, you talk to five or six people and it's like, you know, you're, you're bouncing a ping pong ball off their foreheads, you know? Um, but I've seen enough fruit and enough, um, of these kinds of conversations going on where there's real, um, there's real seed planting going on. Let me just finish this and I can keep answering questions. Um, Paul was innocent of fleshly and factious dissension. Dissension for the sake of chaos. He was not a quarrelsome man. Paul was not an ideological terrorist. He was not just in it to, to, to create chaos. But Paul did walk into public spaces and speak the gospel with the kind of clarity, that's boldness, that collided with unbelief and idolatry. Paul never used a carnal weapon, but he most certainly was a fighter. Given this unmistakable apostolic pattern, Wagner, Roger Wagner, again, notes that Christian ministers must recognize that without boldness, they cannot please God. And boldness means speaking the truth of God clearly, in the face of fear. Boldness is not about being loud or bossy. Boldness is knowing and articulating the way Jesus confronts the people standing in front of you, and therefore boldness also means going out into the public spaces in order to tell them. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but that was that, um, if anything, I found that open-air preaching has been one of the best things for my liturgical preaching, so preaching in church. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, in, in public preaching, uh, this goes back to Lawrence's question earlier, um, you, have, you have this, you know, 20 second window. Lots of people are just walking by you. They hear you, you know, as you're coming and then they're walking by you and they just listen. Maybe they'll pause for a minute and they'll keep going. But that means that everything has to connect to Jesus. Right? I mean, like what you're trying to do is take everything and take it to Jesus as fast as you can. Um, whether it's a question you've been given, you know, the re reliability of scripture, resurrection, evolution, moral absolutes, whatever it is, and you're trying to take it back to the gospel as fast as you can, or whatever you're talking about, you want to keep connecting it to Jesus. But if you think about it, that's exactly what, 
typological reading of the Bible is too. Right? Jesus says the whole Bible is about me. So if you're reading the Bible, every passage you're trying to take back to Jesus in some fashion anyways. And open air preaching, you know, you can't script that. Right? You don't know the question you're going to get. You know, it's, it's just batting practice. You're just standing up there and they're going to throw anything at you. And you're just trying to hit everything that comes at you. And you're trying to go right back to Jesus. And, um, and it's, um, it's been incredibly helpful because then when you go back and read the Bible and you're prepping for your sermon or you're in your counseling office and you're meeting with a couple that's come in with marriage problems or parenting problems or addiction problems or whatever, again, everything is, you're just taking them back to Jesus. I mean, that, that's, that's what this is about. He's, he's what they need. And, um, but uh, I think the boldness thing too, I, I would say boldness and kindness. So you get angry people and you have to tell them the truth in a way that's probably going to make them more mad, but in a way that is clearly full of love and grace. Um, those two combinations are things that there's not a time in your ministry that you don't need them. <laughs> and what a great way to practice on the fly, constantly. You're mad at me. Okay. Jesus, <laughs> this is how you need to hear the gospel. This is how I love you. And this is the truth of the gospel. Right? And if you can do it with a red-faced guy cussing you out in your face, calling you names, right? and you can, you can keep a smile on your face, stay gracious, and keep pointing them back to the, to the gospel, then you can do it in your office with somebody that's a little miffed at you. Or you can stand up in your pulpit on Sunday morning and you can bring a truth to bear that your people need to hear, that you know maybe some of them are going to be a little bit ruffled by, and you can do it with the love of Jesus. If you can do it on, on the campus, if you can do it in a public square, you can do it in church on Sunday. And it's made, me, it's made me more bold, I think, in certain ways to say things and let the chips fall where they may. And, and in some ways, I think, even more gracious because, because, I, because I'm practicing that with them there. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Well, a lot. I mean, a lot will depend on. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming, um, obviously, that different gifts are given to different people, um, and so on. I'm assuming that a minister, a pastor, is called to do the work of evangelist, um, in some, in some way. Um, it's not the only thing, but it's 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 one of it's one of our duties. Um, what I've found is as I'm doing this more and more. I, um, I mean, I just, I can't help but talk about it. And it's not like, um, it, it's, it, you know, both the, you know, the downer times when it's like, you know, that was, you know, that didn't seem to go so well. And, and, and then the times when it's really exciting. Um, but I ask, you know, I'm, I'm asking for prayer. I'm, I'm regularly, you know, we, when the elders gather for prayer, I'm praying for guys by name that I'm meeting with that are, you know, atheists and agnostics and Hindus and, homosexuals and everything else. I'm like, I'm, I'm praying for them by name because I'm meeting with them and I'm going to see them this week. And, um, and I'm, and I'm talking about them, but I've found that as, as I just, and, you know, and here and there, there's just easy opportunities where there's a sermon illustration or whatever else where it'll just kind of come out, but they know that that's what we're doing or what I'm doing. And I've found that it, it has this again, kind of, you're just, you're just leading. You're, you're in the vanguard, you're at the front and, um, and I think done rightly, it's just encouraging them. And I've, I've found that my elders have started asking for prayer for, you know, like um, you know, you know, uh, Chris Select is in the, um, he's finishing a PhD at WSU. And so he's asked for prayer a couple of times for his advisor at WSU, who they've had over for um, dinner now a couple of times. He's not a believer. It's just like that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and like, I don't remember that happening as much before. Um, or um, he does the um, uh, mock trial team at Logos, and they interact with the county prosecutor, who's not a Christian, and Chris has gotten to be good um, friends with this liberal county prosecutor. 
and and um, and then we had this huge this murder case happen in Moscow over the last year. It was highly publicized, pretty stressful. Um, ended up on I think they did like a 2020 special on it. I mean, it's, you know, kind of it's gotten some national attention, and so it's highly stressful. And Chris has been able to reach out to this prosecutor and telling him that we're praying for him. He had you know mock trial kids send him notes and you know that kind of thing. But he's asking for prayer for him by name. Um, so what I've found is that more and more, just, just by leading and talking and praying like that's a significant part of what we're doing as a church, um, the elders and the deacons and others have just kind of just come right up behind me in a certain way. And then I, as I'm sharing, they're like, hey, would you please pray for this person because I'm meeting with them too. And, and they're doing it in their sphere, yeah, sure. it's, 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 but, but they're doing it. And it's, and it's not just sort of this vague, I want to be a witness, <laughs> vaguely, you know. I, I think, you know, I think reform types have, you know, we, we're not as cheesy as putting crosses on, you know, and, and, and Jesus fish on the back of our bumpers as the, as the even jellyfish around us, right? The, 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 you know, the, the evangelicals around us. But we just have, we just have reformed versions of the same um, failure to interact, Right, we we say you know we say other words presuppositionalism and you know whatever and I'm a presuppositionalist right but but like you know we say words and then we think that sort of magically will make us a witness for Jesus right Van Til you know just put it on our bumper sticker you know and people will just be magically drawn to us right or covenant renewal worship right I don't know what that means <laughs> right. Um, this has been um, one last thing I actually meant to say this is earlier but um, I was talking to um, I was talking to Troy about this um, last night a little bit when I went to um, Greenville um, loved, loved the saints there had a wonderful time there wonderful time God was really good blessed the ministry there but one of the things that I realized when I got there was that um, there was a general assumption that um, that the church was going to grow because of paedo communion, covenant renewal worship, and um, church calendar and cost of Christian education. And I, I think that's an absolute failure. That is not what we are about. We are about Jesus. And because Jesus died and rose again for our sins, yes, he's, and he's given us amazing gifts. And he's given us his word. And yes, we think our children should come to the table. Yes, we think we ought to honor God and how we worship. And yes, uh, we care about training up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But that's not why we exist. <laughs> Absolutely not. And I, and I spent about a year just, you know, we're, we're, we're about Jesus. We're about the gospel. And because we're about Jesus and the gospel, yes, it has implications for all of life. Absolutely. But it's, it starts there. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've come to see this whole area of public evangelism, intentional evangelism. Go knock on the door. Go stand up in the public square and preach Jesus. Um, we have to do that because that, um, that is the stake in the ground that insists that that's the very point. Right? That's the sharp edge. That's what matters. And everything else comes behind it. Everything else comes. And it's got to come. We care about it. But, but, if, but if we don't have that front and center, I mean, I, I, you know, you want people coming in the doors and hearing your people sharing Christ with them and knowing what first things are, right? You want to know, you know, yeah, we can get to Christian, we need to get to Christian education, yeah. But when they walk in the door, the first thing they don't, they don't need to hear a defense of pedo communion, right? <laughs> That's not in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an implication, we get, we get there, but, that, but that, that's not what Jesus did. I mean, if that was that important, Jesus would have showed up and said, make sure the little kids get communion. Right? But, um, but we have, but I think we, we sometimes have that. I think that's one of the challenges in the CREC. You have these you know, certain distinctives, and, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm all about it. But that's, those are all, they come next. Um, it's Jesus first. It's the gospel first. It's, um, and, and um, it's sin, grace, forgiveness first. And, um, and, and we've got to lead with that. And there's no better way to train yourself to lead with that when talking to people out there who don't know what reform means, who don't know what Presbyterian means, 
Don't even know what your collar means. Don't know what any of that means. And, um, and you just have to say it's about Jesus. All right, I've gone way over time. Thank you. Can I pray for us? Father, I pray that you would make us bold for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Jesus, that we would not bear your name in vain, that we would not bear the office of pastor or minister or elder in vain, but rather that you would empower us by your spirit. And just as the apostles prayed that you would give them boldness, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit and make us bold to speak the truth plainly, openly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.